Good evening. Um, my name is Selena and I um, work at the ICO. I'm a curator. Uh, well, I'm, I'm one of the curators of the Cinema of Ideas. Welcome to this evening's In Conversation, George Clark Unlocks the ICO's Archive. Um, and welcome to the Cinema of Ideas. Um, for, for those of you who don't know what the Cinema of Ideas is, the ICO's virtual screen. It's a space for us to discuss um, moving image culture, film culture, film histories that might have been um, forgotten or hidden that we're bringing back to the fore. Um, and some of, in case some of you don't know about the work that we do at the ICO, we are the UK's national body in support of independent cinemas of all forms. Our activities include programming, training and events, and you can find more about us at independentcinemaoffice.org.uk. Um, a special welcome this evening to audiences from our partner cinemas across the UK and also audiences from the ICO network and also those of you who have found us for the first time. And thank you to our funder, um, the ICO, um, the sort of Cinema Ideas Funder, which is the BFI, awarding funds from the National Lottery. A few housekeeping things to remember. This event is being live captioned. Um, thank you to Heather for being our captioner this evening. Uh, it's being recorded and will be available to view straight after um, tonight on um, the Cinema of Ideas website, which you can find um, through the ICO's um, website, um, and um, also on the on the ICO's YouTube channel. You can find previous um, Cinema of Ideas discussions um, because we're keeping an archive of of the work that we've been doing. Thank you to my colleagues Sammy and James for doing the tech this evening. Our discussion is going to take about 40 to 45 minutes um, and then we'll leave time at the end for questions and comments. But if you want to, um, you know, say anything as we go along, have any comments, um, anything, please get involved in the conversation. You can just post something in the chat and Sammy will pass your questions on to me and um, I'll read them out. Uh, and we will finish promptly at 7.30. Um, so I'm now just going to quickly tell you what we've got coming up on the Cinema of Ideas. On the 10th of May at 6.30, we'll be wake welcoming Terence Davis, the filmmaker, onto the Cinema of Ideas to be in conversation with Brian Robinson. Um, this is to mark Vertigo's release on the 20th of May of Terence's latest film, Benediction. And we're really thrilled to welcome him onto the platform to discuss the making of the film, but also to reflect on his really incredible career as, in our opinion, one of Britain's foremost film poets. And in tandem with that talk, which will be free, we're streaming Terence Davis' acclaimed trilogy um, on our platform from the 29th of April to the 12th of May. Um, so now I'm just going to introduce this, our guests this evening, um, their biographies. I mean, um, maybe some of you know who they are, um, but uh, I'll just uh, I would need to situate their work for those of you who don't. George Clark is an artist, curator and writer. His films have shown at festivals and museums internationally from New York, from the New York Film Festival to Taiwan Biennale. He has curated projects for museums, galleries and cinemas with a focus on broadening the histories of film and video practice globally. Through his work at Tate Modern from 2013 to 2015 and in independent projects, he has curated numerous retrospectives as well as thematic exhibitions from Japanese expanded cinema to LA Rebellion, creating a new black cinema at Tate Modern. He is a lecturer at the University of Westminster. And Catherine Deforge is uh, the director of the Independent Cinema Office. She founded it in 2003 and continues to lead on the overall strategy and development of the company. Prior to founding the ICO, she worked at the BBC, the BFI, Arts Council England, and as a senior programmer at the National Film Theatre. Uh, she also programmed the Encounters Film Festival in Bristol and worked as a uh, freelance film program programmer both in the UK and internationally. So uh, welcome to our guests, Catherine and George. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of like going to be the sort of the interlocker. I'm going to be the one who's going to be asking questions to, to Catherine and George because uh, this project, uh, the ICO Essentials, the secret masterpiece of cinema, I wasn't working at the ICO um, when this happened and I've got tons and tons of questions about how this incredible 
uh, Artist Moving Image project came about. Um, it was amazingly ambitious. Um, it happened in 2008. And I guess my sort of opening question to, to Catherine and, and George is what was the kind of curatorial kind of proposition for for ICO Essentials um, and what we, why did you want to do this this project? What what, what were your intentions behind it? Mm. Um, that's that's really interesting. I mean, to think because part of it involves thinking back to what it was like in two thousand and eight, like it's what cinema was like. You know what the UK was like and how you accessed work and how you talk to audiences. And now, like, since we started talking about this, when, when we had some um, conversations prior to this evening, part of me thought, my gosh, that was completely mad. What was it? <laughs> and we were a lot younger. We were all a lot younger in those days. And you always have these kind of really big ideas that you think you can, you can make happen and that would be really brilliant. And then you start doing it and you think, oh, my gosh. But anyway, um, so the ICO, part of uh, why the ICO was set up or the thinking behind the ICO, well, the idea was that we wanted, you know, because this is in the days before the internet and streaming and all these things and uh, you know, Blu-ray. And um, the idea was that wherever you lived in the UK, you'd be able to see the same thing as if you lived in kind of central London or a capital city or whatever. And it's very much about evangelizing and trying to share work that you were really passionate about and that you were excited about. And one of the, the things that had happened prior to that was that artist film, the originally artist film was obviously shown in the cinema, um, uh, generally, that cinemas had stopped showing work in that way as much and it had happened in galleries and that there had been this kind of siloing of what what work you expected to see in the cinema and so sometimes what you had when you did have artist work was it was on a kind of you know monday night at you know i don't know you know like 5 30 and you know the people and it was called artist film and the people who might come and see it were the same people and yeah. it was and it was very much packaged up in that way and i guess without being too glib, it was it was kind of like, you know, here's something difficult and hard mm. that only a certain section of people will like or understand or, you know, be interested in. And I really, really wanted to change that and do something so about it. So I started thinking about all of these films that people, you know, like what was a way of kind of, if you like, doing that? Mm. you know, what and, and how would we start to talk about this work so that people might really engage with it? Because I guess in a way, what we try and do a lot here is, is you're always trying to talk or reach or, you know, communicate with people mm. who don't know, you know, it's, it, you, want, you want to be always broaden the audience. You're always interested in audiences. And I think audiences are really actually interested in, in taking risks and trying new things. But only if you talk about it in a certain, you know, that you've got to get the kind of mode of communication right to do it. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. Yeah. But when you do do it, people are really willing to go with you. So that's kind of where the idea came from. So I was interested in this idea of what are the, what are the classics, what are the essential things that you should have seen? What are, the, what are the things that have influenced lots of people? What are the, and, and that's kind of where the idea came from really. Um, so at what point did you um, start working with George? I mean, how, did he come in at the beginning of the project, obviously developing the, the shape of the program, working with the curators, but in the sort of application, funding application stage was George was there from the start or did he, did he come in a bit later I think I think I wrote the application and got the money and then we um and then George came in at the beginning at the beginning of the project but I had met George because you had done some work at Lux mm. and and you were even young but obviously yeah. <laughs> young now but um, and you applied and you so yeah we we applied we applied to the arts council and it was part of a bigger project we also had the artist cinema um yeah. which was another sort of project we did where we were trying like get artist film in front of it was a, we commissioned the work from artists five short films from artists and we put them in front of films like bond Mm. and you know sex in the city and twilight and play them in cinemas across the uk and so we, it was part of a much bigger project but um yes yeah, so we raised the money and got and got the funds and then we advertised the job mm. and that's when george started working on it yeah and i think at that time 
right? You had this like emerging field, like really in a way, like what you were talking about earlier with like how venues used to present work, they often presented it in quite a negative way. So they're always, it was this experimental film. So it was kind of hard. Yeah, very it was, hard. It was against cinema, against all these criteria. And I think already in like 2000, you could see that discourse was shifting. Like we have the emergence of this idea of like artists move an image. And we also had like an embrace of narrative an embrace of different types of representation and a kind of collapse of these like historic, you know, kind of oppositional stance of movement image, you know, still a critical area of practice, but it was like, it couldn't be defined in that simple way anymore. No. And so it needed to also be programmed in a different way and for the thinking behind, you know, who this work was for, how it intersect with other areas of practice was kind of central to that. And I think, yeah, that the kind of artist cinema commissions was like, that was like the trailer. So they were things that would literally like reoccupy that cinema space in the position where, you know, trailers would be shown, but like, what would it be like if you were to reclaim that space as a space for kind of artistic invent intervention? And I think then the idea with the, to do with the kind of thematic program was that, okay, if that's the trailer, what's the thing that's set? And like, how do we then present a bigger, more ambitious kind of program that would also take into account like the fact that artist cinema is not a singular thing that can be defined, but is has a you know many different histories, many different voices. It's pluralistic. So what would a kind of that project of a kind of historical, a kind of essential cinema be, and what would that look like now in the twenty first century? Because you know, like anyone who follows this, you know, there's many books that will tell you what those canonical films are. But it's really important to like rethink that at this point of like you know, convergence of all this new areas of practice that were kind of occurring everywhere. And it seemed like the cinema was being left out of part yeah. of that discussion, part of that excitement. So it's to try and blend those worlds again and kind of bring, look at ways to kind of intersect them and kind of bring yeah. them back into conversation. I mean, I think at that time, it was definitely true that it was seen as this, this area was like really exciting. And this mm. is where all the interesting work was being done. And that there was a sort of like a view that cinema mm. was kind of moribund, you know, that, that, you know, that it was dull. It was, you know, kind of as always, you know, it's on its way out. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not the place you would find anything interesting happening. You know, that, I think there was definitely that view as well, wasn't that? But we were always, I guess the incentive was always to say, actually like cinema is this thing that needs to be, re it's always been reinvented and it's still a young art form. And it's like by relocating those things, like you can bring back that like excitement again and make room for these other sort of voices, you know, and make sure that's integrated into any like curatorial project. Okay, so you've got the sort of the premise and we've set the kind of the context, the tone of the time in 2008, what was going on, which is super, super interesting. So then um, what's next? So you basically decide to work with six curators um, and you ask them to curate a 90 minute film program. Can you talk us through how that process worked and why you decided not to do it all yourself, George? Yeah, I mean, because of this idea of like, this is a pluralistic art medium, right? And its strengths are in its diversity. So it felt also to go against the ambition of the project if it would be singular. So it felt important that we needed to represent many voices, you know, and have different perspectives. And in a way, this is something from the artist cinema. So the artist cinema were launched with a kind of screening, a cinema that was built at the Freeze Art Fair that Ian White used to coordinate. And this is like, rather than trying to define something, it was like treat each program as a kind of argument or as a proposition. And I think in a way, like this idea of audiences are smart, you know, they shouldn't be like patronized. It's like they'll respond much more to an idea or an argument or a prophecy. No one wants like a linear history anymore. Things have shifted, Tate Modern had opened, it was, it was organized thematically. So it felt like there needed to be a film program that would do that. It wouldn't be a kind of plodding like introduction. If we're going to do something around this idea of classics, we needed to make arguments for that. And so the idea to like bring in a range of voices from you know film curators to art, you know, people working predominantly in gallery spaces, but also try and represent those different perspectives. And the key brief would be that the project should not, rather than kind of, you know, partition someone out like, okay, you do the 30s, you do the 40s. Each project needed to somehow bridge the 20th century and to try and make a kind of thematic link between two, two periods. 
So it could be from surrealism to psychedelia, could be from, you know, kind of early kind of queer cinema to abstract expressionism, but something that would kind of bridge two kind of art historical themes and to try and force that and say, okay, how can we then thread together these, you know, things that we know about history of visual arts in the 20th century, things you know about cinema, and how can we like tell those as entangled stories? So that was a brief to the curators. And, you know, what was great was that they all also respond in ways that totally surprised us. And, you know, certain works I was sure would be in one program turned up in another and vice versa. I think that was a testament to the kind of strength of that as an idea to kind of also make those things fresh and surprising. So even if you knew and you'd read all the books, you'd still kind of find new connections and new bedfellows within this kind of program. So we wanted it to be both an introduction, but also to kind of people who maybe have a familiarity to see things in a new light as well. Great. So should we, maybe we should like, um, I think because Sammy's got some slides and um, maybe we should just go through um, who the curators were, the, the kind of the program that they curated um, and maybe some of your reflections about their curatorial kind of, I mean, you said a little bit about that, but maybe, well, let's pull up yours, 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 George. So ICO Dreams. Yeah. Yeah. So this program in a way kind of tried to, you know, look at one of these founding concepts around like artist practice that would deal with the kind of subconscious, you know, so from, you know, this still is from uh, Salvador Dali and uh, Louis Manuel's uh, Oshan Lou, you know, kind of classic work, you know, that kind of opened up this kind of proposition. But then we wanted to follow that in this alternative line as well. So we had later things like, you know, Maya Deren with Mesh of the Afternoon, so the beginning of kind of this mythopoetic film, but also kind of surrealist feminist animation like Susan Pitt's Asparagus, which you might not think of kind of together, but it was really interesting to kind of blend, you know, animation with kind of figurative work um, and kind of bring those into new sort of dialogues and conversations and to kind of see, you know, to see the surrealism as kind of anticipating future kind of psychedelic practice and vice versa. And maybe one of the things we're thinking about with a lot of these programs is also this sort of, you know, to make it exciting and to not make it kind of uh, like this too kind of didactic. So the idea was also thinking about like the midnight movie. So thinking about mm. things like Eraserhead or like, you know, Jodorowsky's El Topo. So it should in a way be a program that would kind of exist in that kind of orbit. And um, I think also, I mean, maybe we should talk a bit about, um, you know, because one of the most amazing things about the project was uh, about, you know, that you're working with uh, films and materials that a lot of it was obsolete you had to kind of create kind of new what we would say then hd scans um new prints of of work so i know that my dare and message of the afternoon that 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 was a film that was part of of this kind of well it was a it wasn't a restoration but it was a digitization a new digitization and that's super super exciting you know for me also um you know, I mean, I'm very particularly interested in feminist kind of film history. So much women's film history is not available to be watched in the cinema. And, 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 and then if you do watch it, it's just on terrible prints. They're so knackered and so discolored. It, it's, it's, it's just really depressing. So can you tell us about, you know, for example, with the Maya well, Deren? Well, it was really interesting. So Dreams was that like the, this is at the beginning of digital film distribution and, mm. and, and digital screens. And we applied for some money to, I think it was a film council mm. then, to, to, um, to digitize. So we wanted to be able to release it digitally. And that was a kind of a big deal at mm. that point, you know, because it was, the, but there was a digital screen network and cinemas had already started putting um, screens in and we managed to get some money out of the film count. I mean, now it seems like really bonkers. Like, I just think, you know, because they were obviously funding, like, you know, the King's Speech or whatever. And then we said, can we get some money <laughs> to digitize this program? <laughs> and we released it. So, Dreams was the one we, we released it and we put it on the FDA mm -hmm. list. It got reviewed. And, but of course, that was all part of, of the strategy. But I mean, I think. Um, there were so many films, like we started with a you know, list of all these classics and, and, and George can speak more to this, and the, the, the work it took to get those 
to get the, the materials. And, and there was a sort of received wisdom that, oh yeah, there's a print of this. And then you go, like you say, go, mm. you go and look at this print and it would be like a grade four print or a grade five print. And if you said, oh, I'd like to put that into this, because in those days, obviously, if you hadn't digitized it, you'd have to put them all together and cinemas would have had to show them like that. And mm. then it would be like, no, there's no way you're doing that. You know, we've got one grade five print. And the detective work to track this material mm. down and to find it was so difficult. And actually, this was a moment when, it, talking about materiality of film mm. and all these things, that actually digital really worked well for this programme in terms of making things available. But yeah, I think, I mean, essentially it was like trying to look at those, like what were the barriers to exhibition, right? And a lot of the barriers are also what make arts film interesting. Like it's <laughs> awkward, it kind of makes all these problems, but then it limits its ability to be distributed. You know, and I think the crucial thing here is like, this limit is quite a new condition. Like 16 millimeter was, in, you know, a huge network of venues. It was very portable, it was very kind of distributable. But that was becoming more tricky. So this idea of like how to really disseminate this across these venues that had maybe lost some of that expertise. So kind of making it this sort of available as a DCP was really central to that. But it took a lot of work. And I should also say that we launched everything, we launched everything at Tate Modern, and there we showed all the you know things on original formats. So a combination of 35, 16, and variety of video formats. But then to make it possible to release them as a feature, we need to transfer that. And so, yeah, especially after it was relatively simple, there was a scan. And at that time, Anthology Film Archives were working on a restoration, but it wouldn't have been to maybe blow up to 35, but it was going to be too late for us. Um, Asparagus, Susan Pitt made a new scan directly in the lab in LA to send to us. Larry Jordan, um, he actually made the first ever 35 mil blow up from his film, Our Lady of the Spheres. It's a beautiful like film that's made in a very simple um, kind of technical process. So with a series of three inter, inter negatives that are each have a kind of different filter that are printed sequentially. So working with his original lab, they made a blow up of that for 35 that we could then scan. So the like and a lot of this was very like, you know, kind of longer process to sort of do and to kind of coordinate. And I should say like these are just some of the examples, you know, across this first program to kind of make all of this material kind of uh, be able to show again, to show together. And that also kind of meant we could see this work in a different way. Because I think we were trying to make this argument like this is area of practice that has influenced all types of cinema and will be familiar to you even if you've not seen yeah. it. Yeah. But if we're going to do that and we're going to say you have to see it, it's worth seeing that like, we need to show things in a good way. So one key example of that, Sammy, maybe you can go to the um, Le Jus des Anges image that we have. So this is the a kind of comparison of the Brobchik film. So this is a kind of classic, you know, European sort of surrealist animation. And it was generally known and even written about as having this like sepia mud red color, right? Which is the image you see at the top. And even I've seen that as a retrospective, Brobchik retrospective that Daniel Bird had organized that the old look cinema with, when Ian White was programming there and was amazed by this film, you know, but then when we kind of made a new print of it and saw it again, we realized that it wasn't red at all. Like this was totally fictional color and it was more of a kind of cold blue, you know, this kind of deathly hues of kind of blue and green. So I think that was kind of central to this idea of saying like, even if you feel you know these films, we're going to be able to show them in a new kind of authoritative way. And to be able to see them and kind of have that investment in the kind of restoration and making them available, you know, in ways that could be both thematically seen in a kind of fresh way, but also the materials would kind of stand up as well. That's so interesting. Um, so you mentioned Ian White, he yeah. curated a program uh, um, called Expression, which is one of my favorite programs. Can you tell us a little bit about working with Ian? Um, he was, you know, a, a very important curator um, and his ideas still kind of live on in the kind of artist moving image kind of world. Um, can, can you tell us what, about working with him and, and the program that he, that he put together? Yeah, yeah. So this, uh, we have a hopefully poster for Ian's program. So he curated this program called uh, Expression, right, which looked at ideas of uh, 
identity politics, queer cinema, and but kind of cross spectrum. So it really it was the most expansive program in terms of the time frame it covered. So it went from Jermaine Delac, you know, kind of early kind of surrealist, you know, feminist film pioneer, you know, making films in France in the 1920s, up to the kind of uh, videotapes of Sadie Benning, you know, made in the kind of riot girl movement in the kind of 90s. So it can have this huge media spectrum. You know, it's kind of really central. And Ian, you know, that time, you know, as I said, was programmed before the Lux Center, also kind of coordinated the program at the Freeze Art Fair. And it also around the same time had done this incredible program at the Oberhausen Film Festival called Kino Museum, that tried to reimagine like the cinema as this kind of thematic halls of a museum. So each film program would kind of operate that. And that was a big inspiration on thinking about these kind of thematic link links. So it's clear like in, you know, would be one of the key people to sort of invite, um, to sort of come, come in on the program. Um, and he'd really, you know, kind of brought together many kind of strands of his interests and really responded to these kind of interesting new kind of minglings and kind of dialogues that were possible. Because often, also in a kind of, in an overly like materialist determined program, and also in the way that experimental film was often shown, you wouldn't have these very interesting bedfellows. So there's a kind of opposition between video and film or kind of yeah. art history and, you know. People from different art. kind of schools or sort of areas or collectives, you know, yeah. they, weren't, they, do, they weren't shown together. The idea of, of uh, you know, it was it was kind of silent, wasn't it? It was that sort of, it's quite traditional, you know. Yeah. So, and Ian was great, you know, like as a, you know, agitator, it's like a, you know, very kind of provocative programmer who's all, always like discomfort, boredom, like these are also things to be played with and part of an experience or way to be sort of challenged in other ways. Um, so that was kind of really, he was one of the key people like when thinking about this conception of the project that felt like we definitely had to invite Ian. And did um, the curators um, present the their programs around the UK or did were they mainly did they mainly stay in London and and and, and were part of the Tate weekend did they did they travel with with the with the programs the I mean in a way we tried to really make this as a project a program that would kind of be you know kind of fit into this DCP model and this yeah. is this idea that it should be it should be robust enough to kind of travel on its own yeah and as much as those like other elements of films, you know, it's kind of so essential and part of the kind of culture of moving in, it also means that it kind of can limit that life. And Ian was very, you know, articulate about this, saying actually a lot of the history of artist practice is closer to performance in that way, because it's often about this kind of liveness. So the challenge and also the kind of the curatorial challenge, which also came from the artist cinema idea, was like you have to make something that is going to live in a kind of hostile environment. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's got to kind of fight it's got to work. And kind of occupy that space and reclaim it, you know? And part of it was that, you know, it's about the audience response to mm. it. So you don't want to kind of tell the audience like how to receive it. And this was, and again, part of the artist cinema was like, mm. you've come to watch Twilight and we are going to show you an artist film that's five minutes before it. But we won't say to you, it's an artist, it's an artist. You know, so you're moving away from this idea that these things are named and seen in a particular way and there's a particular audience and their reception is mm. a particular thing. And I think that the, um, uh, the essential season is, is like that, isn't mm. it? Because it's kind of like, some of these films were not made when they were shown originally, yeah, yeah. they weren't shown in that way where somebody had to explain them or present them or tell you how to, they were, and then people responded in, in had their own, mm. because that's kind of the most amazing thing about this work, isn't it? That you, like all great art, it, it's, it sort of brings different things out in you. And it kind of, you know, you respond, people respond to it differently. Mm. And that's the thing that makes a difference to you, that, that, that kind of changes your life, if you like, when you see them. And mm. so actually being able to respond to it freely without having a kind of context or somebody saying, you know, I've curated this and this is my, you know, blah, blah. Actually, that, that was the part of, sort of integral to mm. the project itself isn't it? yeah and this idea that you know not everything's for everyone like it's kind of good that you maybe hate one of the works in the program <laughs> that's like maybe it's like if we can hate more we can also love more so that's okay and ian was uh, always a big advocate of that idea you know to kind of create 
to not kind of curate and kind of round all the edges, you know, not make everything too smooth, but kind of create that friction. And I think that was something we wanted to kind of make these like propositions that kind of could be disseminated and would kind of bring back some of that excitement of the cinema, of being in the dark, of like being challenged by something, not knowing what's going to happen next. And I think that was what, for me, was also something that was kind of most, like felt like one of the successes of the project was that idea really kind of picked up and kind of got a lot of traction and people were really enthused about this idea of like rediscovering the cinema as this place of like encounters, as this place of chance. And I think more and more like in the streaming age, like I crave that, mm. you know, because everything is so overdetermined. So kind of having a place where these things, and so I guess, you know, the other models, you know, which are similar things to, you know, with these like late night channel four programs or like Amos Vogel's uh, films of subversive art. So trying to just connect to those histories of like other curatorial projects that try and, you know, kind of intervene, kind of surprise you, challenge you, disturb you, kind of central to bring back to the cinema. And I guess it's that thing of kind of the live encounter, like mm -hmm. with the, you know, with the, you know, sitting in the audience, but also with the work itself um, that, you know, is so specific to the cinema space as well. Um, and I will definitely come back to, I really want to talk about kind of audiences and kind of, you know, responses, etc. But I think we should mention the other curators, obviously. Um, so then you, so you had four other curators you work with. So Michelle Cotton, she curated a program um, under the theme of modernity. Absolutely. Can you tell us a bit a bit about Michelle? Because I didn't know about her before. Actually, I was kind of doing pre preparation work for this talk. Yeah, so Michelle, I got to know because she was working with a, a place in uh, Sheffield called S1 Art Space, which is a gallery within a studio complex. And she started a, a festival within this field and started the program in a very ambitious way but kind of very much coming from kind of artist studio kind of background. So she was, the, you know, young curator looking at this kind of emerging field of the moving image that kind of came in almost entirely from the kind of gallery site, you know, and was occupied within that, but was also very interested in the possibility of a screening. And so with S1 Sound, they actually ran a festival that toured initially between different, so they made kind of touring programs. So she was also someone who's like very active in this field who really wanted to kind of bring in and was thinking about the cinema space in these exciting ways. And her program, Modernity, you know, looked at this kind of question. And I think her program had the most work. So you see here, it's like a long kind of group of work, some very short, like Lazo and Holly Nagy films, and right up to someone like uh, Mark Leckie, who's made, whose video, Fear Which You Made Me Hardcore, was one of the, you know, sort of key. And I think the last work we did have, I think we had a cut off of 2000. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we should maybe not go too recent, you know. And in a way, that was what was covered with the Artist Cinema Commission. Yeah, because yeah. it took a long time. I mean, it, it was like 18 months, two years, this project. I mean, it was like, now it seems like, I mean, I can't, we, we, when would we ever have two years to work on a project? But, um, but that's how long it took, wasn't yeah. it? So it, it took a long time. And I, I think, I mean, this is something I always got from, yes, it's like, to do an introduction is actually the hardest thing. Yeah. Like to, to do something that is like in a, you know, talking to experts, you don't need to do anything, but in the way to kind of try and start like, okay, how, and that was one of the, a lot of discussions were great is like, this has got to work wherever yeah. we situate it. You know? Yeah, it's not, so if you're having these conversations with the curators, it's not for people like you, it's not for you. Like, like it, we can't, we can't, the audience will not be like you. So you've got to, which of course is integral to mm. sort of programming or curation anyway. It's like, it's not, you're not doing it for yourself. Or if you are, you could do it in your own house, can you? But the minute you sort of put it into the cinema space, you've got to engage, you've got to be able to engage and open things up mm. to an audience. Because if you don't, then, you know, it's like so sort of dispiriting, you know, it's like you're closing everything down. Yeah. And I think it's about, it's like always this sort of, because with that, and the thing, like the argument that we had the world grip was like, that's big responsibility. And that's the challenge, right? It's how to make it, how to like keep the integrity of the work and do it really well and do it sort of work at Tate Modern to the highest snap, you know, but also, you know, the same, and this is the, I think the thing that's, you know, the ISO is founded on this idea is like, 
the same audience would be could be in a tiny art center in a village of 3,000 people, you know, as in a city of 10 million. But they deserve the same cultural access. And that's the promise of cinema, the thing that's remarkable about cinema. It's like the same thing. And that's what I grew up on in a village watching like, you know, crazy things on VHS. They could see like the best films in the world, but you know, in a, in a village with no cinema, in a town with no cinema. You know? Yeah. I mean, like I, I, I looked at the figures and the tour went to like 52 venues, you know, mm. around the UK. I mean, that's just, in, it's just the scale of it. It's just massive. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, I mean, it was, was this, a, was it a mixture of kind of single screen cinemas, multi-arts venues? Yeah, I mean, when we released Dreams, people people played it for a week. I mean, it was a, I mean, it's a different times. But yeah, it was a mixture. It was a mixture of venues. Um, so that one we were able to do on DCP, but the others we had to do uh, on film. And so yeah, it was. A, but it was a mixture. It was a mixture of venues, mm. and the whole point was to get it round. And so a lot of those, some of those venues were places that were not, you know, there might be sort of traditional venues that you might expect to show work like this and but mm. there were plenty of others that had never shown anything that you know you would have thought of as artist film or experimental film before no and they were some of the best because they yeah. were like really great you know they're like I and mean, there's some i think there's one place i don't on the isle of man that we're going to have like a specially prepared meal so you're going to like cook to show dreams and i was like i don't and they're going to make asparagus dish and maybe something <laughs> else and I, know, I was just like, great, go. Sounds mad. <laughs> Sounds mad. I should say, maybe also, if we go, we can have a look at Pop. Maybe we have a look at Pop. Uh, Pop's got a lovely poster. So Pop was curated by Tanya Layton, who at that time was just uh, finishing a book for After All on like a new reader around artist moving image. Um, now she runs a gallery, the Tanya Layton Gallery in Berlin. Um, very interesting and very kind of international curator this time. And she made this really great program that, that was the other, the second, we managed to release two as a kind of theatrical release. So Pop also had a kind of run at the ICA. And that's when Peter Whitehead came to kind of introduce the screenings and kind of hang out. So we could have some events like that, which are really great to kind of add that sort of special, you know, to kind of just make sure we had, you know, we didn't want it to be totally abandoned, but where we could kind of make those links was really important. And should we just um, pull up um, uh, James Harding's um, yeah. um, program, Play? That, oh yeah, I love that. Yeah, Play, yeah, so this is, I mean, this image is like from the Kuchar brothers that I think, you know, any, they were some of the, the few like American experimental filmmakers that were kind of, there was a videotape dedicated to the Kuchar brothers films. That I think was like traded around front and they'd shown on Channel 4 late night with huge influence on John Waters. So it's kind of central to kind of reconnect, you know, because it's the history of, you know, American underground. And I think James did this great program that bridged. James was creating at this time, he's based in between Liverpool and London, working with a lot of the time with fact. So it's also to kind of bring kind of Dada film into kind of American underground and also right up to like this kind of absurdist video by Jake and Dinos Chapman. So all the programs in a way you can see they're all this quite, you know, like threading together things that are more sort of familiar with things that are sort of surprising. So even if you knew Dada films, if you knew René Clark, if you knew Hans Richter, you know, you'd be kind of surprised or shocked by other kind of- Yeah, you wouldn't films. expect to see René Clair, George Cooper, like yeah. anywhere <laughs> else. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just not like, it's not what you would expect at all. Um, and um, oh my gosh, we, we're really, it's 10 past seven already. And, having, <laughs> and let's just, let's just, um, and the Otterlith group, obviously, you yeah. know, last but not least, I mean, you know, phenomenal kind of researchers, curators, um, intellectuals. Can you tell us about working with them? Yeah, they were great. I mean, it was great when we first proposed it to uh, Angelica and um, Kojo, they were kind of split. They really wanted to do modernity, you know? And you could see their interest in like Afrofuturism and music, you know, kind of really linked, but then they kind of really settled on the kind of protest program. And I should say like all the curators, we kind of gave them this like one word to kind of respond to and kind of unpack. And so they like, and throughout that process, I mean, partly it was a long process that we did a lot of like, detective work yeah. to find things out, but also it's like very discursive. 
So I would, you know, send send the curators kind of films or suggestions and different things to look at, and then they would also send me lists and like, hey, can you find any film by these people? So Henry Stork was one of the filmmakers I really wanted to discover but couldn't find get hold of, and they were really dedicated to screening this film called Seventy Nine Spring Times. Um, it's a film about Ho Chi Minh, made by the Cuban filmmaker Santiago Alvarez. He was like a mainstay of like, you know, 60s, like political film, um, but whose work, you know, like there were prints all over, but were almost impossible to clear the rights. I think at that time, I kind of pretty much every night for about three months, I called up the Cuban film like archive. <laughs> And would try in my bad Spanish to like get through to someone to clear the right. I <laughs> would just hear these like receptionists would be like, yeah, CC si, si, a momento, and then just put the phone down. <laughs> and I just sit there for like 30 minutes hearing like the office sort of chatting. <laughs> I'm sure we had a huge phone bill from that time. But that like, and you know, and eventually we got it through the Arsenal in Berlin. So it was also this like you know, there's this like network as well. Cause you know, one of the things we were kind of fighting for is like these films should not be so hard to get hold. Like they're really ri- well written about, well seen, well yeah. circulated. People would be surprised at how difficult and hard it was to get some films that mm. they would perceive would uh, like, as always with our cut films, you know, like I, people would be like, I can't believe that's not available or I can't believe you can't get it. And, but it was really hard to get some of them, wasn't it? Or they were just, it was impossible or really expensive or... And some works, it wasn't the right time, you know, yes. like, so the, you know, Oscar Fischinger, you know, the kind of great, you know, early abstract, you know, animator, you know, the estate was in the process of starting to re-edition works for kind of installation. So they're making their own kind of, you know, HD scans so they could be shown and kind of restoring works that never been shown before as he did intended. And um, so we had a long conversation with them, but it was just like within their trajectory of the restoration, it kind of wasn't ready. So maybe if it was two years later, it could have worked. So there were like a lot of things that we'd hope to get, but just, you know, kind of didn't always kind of match up. That I think it was also great that, you know, the curators, you know, like responded to that and kind of found, you know, un- more unusual things, I think also made the programs better. Yeah. 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 That, that was actually one of our, one of a question that we had from the audience. How did your planned program compare with the final version? Did you manage to get everything you wanted or did it end up quite different? No. Uh, some of, some <laughs> yeah. of it, I mean, there are films in those programs that we always wanted from the beginning, you know, like Apropodin or Shian Andalou. Mm. I think Shian Andalou is the one I thought we've got to have Shian Andalou, we've got to have, you know, like mm. all of the other. But then equally, there were other films, weren't there, that we tried for, to get for ages. And, you know, you talk to, you know, and then we'd think, who can speak French? You know, yes. really <laughs> office, who can speak French? You know, because then you get somebody who can go and talk to the cinema tech from whoever. Who can speak to, there was, you know, like who can speak to the widow, this filmmaker who's got an estate, who doesn't, you know, the, all of those things and so there were some there were quite a few things weren't there that we just couldn't have but there was quite a lot in there that actually we always wanted no and I think like I was so like stubborn too I like would <laughs> <laughs> like I like, refused to like let something drop and so like there were things like for you know for Tanya Layton's program you know we wanted to show the William Klein film Broadway by Light that you know so Really, you know, released by Argos in France. And I remember calling to them and I made the mis- cardinal mistake on the phone of saying, we're interested in this old film. And the distributor who's the kind of founder of Argos is like, would you call like a novel from the early hundreds, an old novel? No, this is a new film. <laughs> and I think she maybe doubled the price on that basis. <laughs> and eventually like that. So even, and that film we kind of managed to get, they didn't have a print, but the best film print was in the, I think it was at the Walker Art Centre in, in oh, America. Oh, that's right. Do you remember it? We had to get it over. And that print arrived, like, the week of the... I mean, like, it didn't arrive. It arrived in the FedEx sorting office on the night of the premiere of Dreams. And the next night was going to be the first screening on Saturday of that programme. So after we introduced the, like, first screen, after screening of Dreams, rather than go out to celebrate, I got, like, a, a tube and a bus to North London and went at like midnight to pick up this 35 mil print in the kind of depot (laughs) to bring all the way back so we could then show it the next day. That's such a great story. Um, Right, we now need to 
talk about the posters which are on your left George and um you know because of course you've got the program you're working with the curators but you've got to market you've got to market the project and so Catherine you decided well you both decided to work with modern activity mm -hmm. oh George can you tell us about what you're approaching them how you work with them and the, and the incredible posters that were produced and that toured with the project yeah i mean design you know because it's like i always like this thing that stephanie schulter strathouse from the arsenal in berlin always talks about showing different films differently right so we always thought like even though we're gonna put these films into dcp and into these cinemas we needed to indicate that this is not the same as what you'd usually encounter and so modern activity you know that was a kind of brief to them is to like make it attractive but also make it resonant make the kind of network of programs kind of link so they came up with this like monochrome scheme and also these kind of ident the design typography for each program that had its own kind of signature um so this is for expression and as you can see all of the programs uh the posters we need like the the design for cinema light boxes so they'd be illuminated so they'd also kind of stand out from a normal kind of poster as well so they're kind of printed on this like acetate and they cost a they cost a fortune, didn't they? I mean, that's one of the things I remembered. It was like, oh my gosh, they they're like we had to say to people, please, you know, like, will you send them back? Because we can't like afford we can only afford this many. Like we can't, you know, like with again with a normal film release, you might people would make posters and then you could always reprint them. Like now, you might think, oh, I'll just reprint it. And um, and this you can't quite see, but it's on metallic paper as well so it's like these lobby cards that were printed to be circulated so they did a lot of work to make it like you know also these objects feel interesting enticing yeah but these these are amazing i mean at the time it was quite stressful wasn't it <laughs> but we have we have some we still have them and there's some of them up in our office and they are beautiful you know they are amazing and i it feels it's such a long time ago really but mm. like the idea that you know you look at them and you think oh my gosh you could imagine doing that now there's it does they don't feel dated mm. or you know it still feels like a really fresh innovative how do we make this different how do we make this special how do we make it look not like everything mm. else but exciting but accessible but open so that people will engage with us and it still does all of those things yeah. you don't look at them and think oh my gosh that's really oh that's really dated you know we wouldn't do that now you know what i mean like it, it still really works I, yeah now do you go george i'm just gonna say i think that like you know the the kind of long process and the difficulty of trying to reconcile these worlds in some way or find ways to creative solutions to that is also, I think, what made the programs really robust, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, it's difficult to show these things in Senate, and a lot of people gave up, or they do, they tried to do it, but they won't go that far, you know. Mm -hmm. So they'd make a tour, and it was, it was like this idea that was floating around, and a few of the organisations had tried to do it in different ways, you know, but often they would end up like creating a kind of cinema within the gallery that would show a kind of program. So in a way, the challenge, you know, we could see that. Or it would show maybe like one place. It would be expensive. So you'd have one place could do it because they had the budget and it would show there for one night yeah. and that would be it. And and the idea of doing something that could work in that many places mm. is just like, but now it feels really ambitious to me. Like if somebody said this to me now, I'd just like be like, no, that's really, that's really, that'll take ages. We're really expensive. We're like, but, you know, but at the same time, it's kind of fantastic, you know, to get all of those films in. Like, I think if you tried to do that now, even now, that would be, it wouldn't be easy. I think we were in a lucky window, too, in a way, mm. like, because it's, it's before, it was like often the first type of conversation for About, a lot of these, yeah, like, scanning things. filmmakers, and also to kind of, to get a license for like a few years as yeah. a release. Because, you know, like most of this, now that's more familiar because people are used to, maybe they can like put something on movie or other platform. Yeah. So they're kind of used to that, you know, kind of, okay, that will cover this many screenings over this layout of time. So a lot, and I think because of, because it was like early to do that, it meant it was harder, but also we weren't, you know, kind of, people were kind of really receptive to it. Yeah. It took longer to persuade them, but in a way we didn't lose, that's why I think yeah. we didn't really lose that many because it wasn't like, 
you know, someone had already sold it to some other platform. Yeah. I mean, how did you make it affordable for cinema audiences? You know, because artist moving image work is famously quite expensive. You know, that's also a barrier for people to go and watch the films in the cinema. Um, how did you make it affordable for for cinemas to show the work? Well, the funding from the Arts Council helped, yeah. but also we we you know it's all the negotiations, wasn't it? It was just some of the um, things we was talking about. So you didn't pay like a fortune for any of them. We had very kind of set. Mm. We we like as in the ICO had a very kind of it's got to come in at this level. You know we can't pay more than that for film, and and all the cinemas had it as a normal you know thirty five mm. and hundred. So that's how much it costs to do all of them. So we had subsidy. We had mm. we had a film budget, you know, a rights budget, and each program had a rights budget. But we had to stay within that, didn't we? Yeah. I'm trying to think. Can you remember now what's the most we paid for anything? Well, I think in a way the what well, so one is like we wanted to pay everyone this yeah. kind of fair, you know the same amount across the programs, but then where there would be difficulties would also be then the material costs. So that's where some of them we could like push, we could yeah. sort of, in a way, we'd, and then we'd share the materials with the artist. So like Susan Pitt, you know, is in the process of trying to make new scans of her films and has subsequently, you know, released them on DVD and on other formats. So then we made an agreement with her, okay, if we cover the lab costs, then she'll allow us to show that kind of film in that way. So often we'd kind of make sure there's, you know, reciprocal arrangement with the artist so they could kind of benefit from you know, new scans, a lot of them, yeah. a lot of the filmmakers have never had like 35 mils, I mean, HD scans at that time. So it's quite a, a, you know, and it's very expensive. And, but because we did so many, like so many, I got a really good deal from a, like a Soho, like yeah. processing that. And I think they were interested in it because it was like really challenging things to scan that they'd never worked on. So I think they were like, we can train up, <laughs> we can train up all of our technicians. It was quite new at the time, wasn't it? Because of because it's the beginning of digital cinema. Mm. And also some of the prints that you made, we mm. then uh, deposited in Lux. So for those artists, they were then able to, you know, subsequently they were hired and screened and, and they were getting back revenues from those films. Yeah. But otherwise they wouldn't have had because there wouldn't have been a new print and they couldn't have afforded to do it. So it sort of made, you know, that we returned everything to you know, the artists, if you like, the artists were then able to get materials, otherwise mm. they maybe wouldn't have been able to afford to do. Um, okay, now we're really running out of time. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna get one more question in. Um, do you think, you know, in terms of kind of like the legacy of the project and kind of audiences, do you, do you have, do you know if any of the cinemas that you worked with continue to kind of program artists moving image work after this tour? Was there, was there kind of like a, a long-term impact about how cinema audiences kind of change their view about watching artist cinema in the cinema? Uh, yes, so they did, yes. Mm. And I think it definitely changed some people's view about what what we understand by artists moving in mm. or experimental film. I think it made some people much more likely to embrace different kinds or, you know, back to this idea of the cinema space mm. and what you do in it, like the idea of the cinema space and what it could do. And then of course, subsequently, you have this movement of artists into kind of narrative, you know, for, you know, so then you have this sort of people like Steve McQueen is the most, maybe the most famous person mm. that people would be familiar with. But, you know, subsequently, you know, you had all of these, I mean, this is where all the exciting work was happening or, you know, like Tasta Dean or whatever, Gillian Waring, you know, I think people were really interested. So then, it, everybody was kind of much more open to that and I think mm. you know if you were in those places in the cinema auditorium and you saw the audiences and then people really engage with the films and start talking about them and like them I think I think for those venues then it became kind of oh okay this this kind of work can create an atmosphere mm. that actually becomes really communal and collective and quite mm. exciting yeah, yeah so yeah I think it I think it really changed um for, I think it changed some things and yeah. I think People, I'm sure someone said to me who came on one of our courses that they they'd been to a screening of this. You know, this, you know, that's the first time they'd seen some of these works. And they said, Oh, I loved, you know, whatever it was, I think it was dreams, you know, I loved watching that. I love. And you just think, oh my gosh. So I think, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think, you know, in a way, like the press, because it was a big press campaign. We worked with Margaret, you know, at that time to kind of help, you know, because things were given a 
release, the actual release. It got like covered in all the broad, you know, reviewed as a feature film. So I think that in a way also just helped, you know, contribute to that broader kind of, uh, you know, coverage of the program yeah. and kind of reconnect. And we did these like cheeky things where we'd sort of know, like, okay, maybe this guy, maybe they'll hate kind of contemporary work, but no one, how can you like, you know, you can't there's like foundational <laughs> works like film history. So it's like, you can't throw that out. And I think what the ambition then was to sort of reinscribe like and say actually like these things these are a part of cinema right and cinema is this bigger field these are things that make cinema exciting and this is the thing that we love and sit, venues love so kind of making that link again they were like oh this is not like these artists are not against us but they're kind of offering other possibilities other ways of thinking and i think that was a kind of shift there was a shift around that time you know to just understand this like cinema is a much more multifaceted Please. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, I, I have to apologize to Massimo because I asked his question inadvertently. He asked, do you think the relationship between audiences and artists films has changed over time and is different now compared to when you approach this project? So it's kind of a leading on from what I yeah. asked. Do you, do you have any? I mean, I, I do. Mm. It's like much less of a UFO, you know. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, this is the thing. I think the thing is like we were always like, actually, these things are not that they're not UFOs anyway, but there's like a perception that it wasn't, you know. And so people who like love cinema or love, you know, people who go to the cinema also, you know, love fashion, they love design, love music, love politics, love all these other things, but they maybe encounter those in other spaces. And what we were trying to do is to say, actually, the cinema is a place that can also engage with these other art forms and link, link to those. And experimental film is not just, you know, it's an area of practice. It was like, as soon as you've dealt with the rest of film history, then you'll get to this stuff left over. Well, actually, maybe it's people come into it who are just into like queer politics, into feminism, into like, you know, history of design. And, you know, maybe they don't like the rest of cinema, but like they can connect to these ideas. Uh, so I think that connected to like, yeah. Or is it, I think that perception, just to know, like, you know, this, that this stuff is not as. Like, yeah. I mean, to me, that's still the most successful programming is when you. We have done some, pro, uh, you, you know, things that you worked on, Selena, you know, like Second Sight, which, which took mm. new work and put it against <laughs> work that was kind of made in the early 80s, essentially, or, you know. And, and one of the things people responded mm. so much mm. to the kind of juxtaposition of, of that work in a way, I think that they wouldn't necessarily have done if you'd have just seen, okay. you know, the old works by themselves or the new works by themselves. Something different happened mm. when you put them both in the same space. Space. And I think that that relationship about audiences and artists, from, I think that has changed. So, you know, like George said, you know, it's not people don't assume then that you, you won't like this or you don't understand mm. this or, or you'll react against this or you'll be actually there's much more of a, a, a embrace of different, mm. uh, you know, of kind of different things. And, and it doesn't have to be. It's a positive thing. Okay, I'm going to now ask a question from David. That's going to be our last question, and it's like a big one. <laughs> has, the, has the pandemic years made you reconsider the place and function of cinema and its relation to moving image, particularly with the acceleration towards online spaces? Ah, that is a big question, but like one we talk about all the time. <laughs> I mean, uh, yes, I think it makes you realise how valuable cinema is. I think one of the things that's happened with the online space, speaking personally, like mm -hmm. doing something like this. So we haven't stopped doing this because actually it means that things can be accessible to people mm -hmm. who maybe can't be in that space for whatever reason. And, and that is really special and kind of, you know, the, the kind of your ability to be able to include more mm -hmm. people is I think you can't kind of, quantify that that's amazing that's 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 and it makes you think you need to do both really mm. or find a way of doing both i mean i think like knowledge is not like knowledge and experience sit side by side and i think in a way like, we're in that a period now you know it's like immense knowledge right you can access all this information which was really difficult to have certain books or certain things or certain catalogs that you could access it now we have this like knowledge, but I think we're also in a way like 
the cinema is still a place of experience, primary experience, and that is really valuable. And in a way for me, definitely after like the pandemic, it's like more valuable. And it's more valuable that we also fight to protect that yeah. as this place of encounter, a place of like confrontation and challenge, you know? And I think that also those places like surprising, to be surprised. I think that's the paradox of the kind of online space, like that ability to be for those encounters, you know, to be surprised in the dark, you know, kind of been reduced. So I think for me, that's like the idea of cinema that I still really kind of love and still crave is that you know, I think that's more important than ever. Yeah, I mean, I guess, it, you know, the, for me, definitely the pandemic made me realise what we'd lost and we hadn't really thought about it before. And it's something also that, you know, I'm a huge fan of uh, B. Ruby Rich, you know, incredible film curator. Um, and she wrote something for Film Quarterly during the kind of when we came, we were coming out of the pandemic and she was saying how she hated, you know, going to festivals online because she was alone with her own experience. And it was just, it was it was the most horrible feeling and it, and I, it really spoke to me as well about kind of this kind of feeling of coming together and kind of the live encounter of kind of being in the cinema space together. Um, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, I mean, I could go on for a long time and, you know, we, it's just amazing to kind of really uncover this sort of exhibition history of kind of ICO Essentials, because I think a lot of people maybe who are who've tuned in, they might not have heard of it or they might have heard of it, but they don't really know what actually went on, the kind of the invisible work that goes on putting these huge kind of ambitious projects together. So um, I just want to thank Catherine and George so much for, well, we're all in the ICO office, but for, for coming to talk about, about the project and the amazing work that you did together. Um, I just, again, to remind you, our next Cinema of Ideas event is on the 10th of May with Terence Davis. Um, an incredible, incredible filmmaker, kind of author, uh, and he'll be talking to Brian Robinson about his new film and also kind of his, his career. Um, so please do, and that's free, so please do, we, we'll be announcing that quite shortly after, in the next few days, so please do come back on the 10th. And Catherine and George, thank you so much for, for your work on this project, it was just incredible and the legacy will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.